that you're in a bar It's always the same old song And that Johnny Walker red By now it's almost gone Well baby I won't be there To catch you when you fall I bet you're in a bar Cause I'm always your last call So, who said these words? The album is fantastic. She's a brand new country artist. Well, new to me that I absolutely love. Wow, I do love her voice. And that whole album is very, very special. That's Sir Elton John. So, (laughs) what does that (laughs) feel like to have Sir Elton John say, I do love her voice and the album is very, very special. Wow. I mean, you know, it's it's obviously a huge honor. Elton John is one of the most innovative and creative minds of our lifetime. And it was even more special because Roseanne Cash, who I had not met before this either, is the one who sent him my album. You know, it's just, you know how it is in our business. There's a lot of clawing and head banging and all those things and so every so often when you have a moment that someone that you really respect and, and admire their work acknowledges what you do and gives the thumbs up that it means a lot yeah did you ever listen to Elton John when you were oh yeah young see that that's the amazing part to me is I found and I don't know how it is for you but it's like some of these influences it's like they find a way to those people later. Right. You know? And it's like out of our control and we don't know how it happens, but it's like you have some connection there to Elton That's John. That's interesting. But Maybe. he's never called me. <laughs> <laughs> the but. Goodbye Yellow Brick Road album I was obsessed with and I oh used God. to get in trouble because I would dance too hard and I scratched it. <laughs> oh. <laughs> but I, uh, I wore that record out. Yeah. I mean, just uh, so many great songs in that record. And it was it was a kind of a magical time for music, that whole era. There was so many different styles. And, yeah. So growing up in Arkansas, who were your influences? Um, I had a ton of influences. And it's interesting to me because I feel like I've had kind of different eras of influences. Um. My grandfather's record collection was my first big influence. Um, And I do mean records. That's what I had. Even I had a Fisher Price record player. (laughs) But uh, um, the first four records he gave me were the best of the Styler brothers, Kenny Rogers, Waylon Willie, and Conway Twitty. And I loved all those artists. But I was watching the Ralph Emery show, and I looked up the episode a while back, and I would have been about four and a half, five years old, and Reba McIntyre was on. Um, And that was the moment that I was like, what is this? Whatever this is, I want to do it forever. And What was she singing? Somebody Should Leave. And I guess, I mean, it's kind of a different influence, but Maya Angelou was a huge influence on me from the time that she spent in Arkansas, and I got to do a couple of projects on her. And um, she had records, but... The spoken word, the phrasing, poetry, and everything. uh, I've always found phrasing to be one of my very favorite parts of writing. I love stories, um, but if you're piecing it down to just the elements, I think the phrasing is probably my favorite. Yeah, there's certain writers that I've read over the years that go, they could have been a songwriter. Like, people like Edgar Allan Poe. Like, there's just such a rhythm Mm-hmm. and a flow to to the words and she was like that also just even though she was a poet wow i mean just and i know she did songwriting too right later on yeah and i've discovered later on that she did she was a calypso artist very early on in her career and she has some oh, stuff wow. that's now on spotify and things that i didn't know about early on but and i got to see her perform live twice um and they just the rhythm of her reading it's awesome. And I've seen Reba. 
over a hundred times. <laughs> really? So, which some of that is from working and doing different things here and whatnot now. But I had so many influences, though. You know, I love George Jones and Merle Haggard. Cash was, I mean, I think being from Arkansas, but also I really, really got into his storytelling. And I love the way that he makes, to me, a much more fully formed character than a lot of people, maybe. Mm-hmm. Not that, than anyone, but he looks at, at the human's uh, flaws and good parts, and he's not afraid to tell those stories that maybe aren't just all pretty and shiny and uh, some kind of different perspectives. Nancy Griffith, Susie Boggess, um, Terry Clark. I got in really into Emmylou Harris. The Wrecking Ball album was like my mind exploded. I'm noticing you just riffed off so many great female artists. When we were coming up in the music business, I think that was one thing that we had so many of mm-hmm. those female artists that they were just at the top of their game and just in, they influenced so many people, you know? It was yeah. a wonderful time. And when I got into writing heavy, I mean, I, I hate almost to start listening off influences because I have so many that it's, <laughs> I mean, Matresa Berg is probably the reason I write songs. Yeah, what a writer. Gretchen Peters, Kim Ritchie, Radney Foster, like I said, I mean, I could just talk about music I love all day long. There's like no end. <laughs> it's like the easiest thing to talk about. I know. Um, so fast forward, when you came to Nashville, how did you get into becoming a professional songwriter? Like what sure. what made that happen? Did you, were you here a while and you were grinding? I mean, you I don't know, think I've ever heard that story. I think one good thing about being green is that you don't know the rules and you don't know exactly what you're supposed to do. And I, I fell in love with music so early and it was so what I wanted to do. I came to Nashville when I was 16 for the first time. Um, and I, I went to fanfare. My aunt took me to fanfare and, uh, I met Bill Anderson, who's one of my favorite songwriters. And I had taken, a trapper keeper full of all the songs I'd written to that point in a backpack and was carrying it around just in case anybody needed a song, you know, because you never know. And I I told Bill, I was like, I said, I want to be a songwriter like you when I grow up. And he said, have you written any songs? And I was like, yeah, I got them right here, you know. (laughs) And he said, well, then you already are. And, you know, I think that was, that was a really pivotal experience for me, that whole thing, because... I probably saw more live music um, in that week than I had seen like in my whole life previous to that. Mm. Although my first two concerts were Reba and Tina Turner. And then, <laughs> I mean, wow, holy crap, both of them, incredible. Tina was a huge influence on me too. I don't know if you've heard her country album, but she's a great storyteller and she kind of has the kind of emotion in her songs that a lot of them could be produced in a country way. Yeah. I mean, Proud Mary is like totally the story song, the heroine, the getting it. But you're right. Even if all the words aren't in the song, her voice tells a story in a way that there's so she can sing half a line and I'm hearing the last 30 years behind mm-hmm. it. Like it, she has so much experience in her voice and like even songs her pop stuff like Private Dancer, so you good. get a sense of the character. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you keep talking about storytelling, so I can tell that's important to you. I love that. Yeah. You know, love songs are wonderful, and there's a lot of love songs I lo- like. But to me, I love getting a little more of a sense. There's a, I mean, there are love songs that have a bigger uh, kind of, more specific, more unique aspects. Yeah. And love is messy most of the time. It's not. Yeah. It's not perfect. So can you play a little bit of Last Call? Sure. Or play the whole thing, however much you feel.
I recognized your number It's burned into my brain Felt my heart beating faster Every time it rains Some things never change That's why I didn't answer I bet you're in a bar Listening to a country song Glass of Johnny Walker Red no one to take you home They're probably closing down Saying no more alcohol I bet you're in a bar Cause I'm always your last call I don't need to check that message I know what it says Baby, I still love you Don't mean nothing When there's whiskey on your breath And that's the only love I get So if you're calling I bet you're in a bar Listening to a cheating song Glass of Johnny Walker Red No one to take you home They're probably closing down Saying no more alcohol I bet you're in a bar Cause I'm always your last Call me crazy But I think maybe We've had our last call I bet you're in a bar It's always the same old song And that Johnny Walker red By now it's almost gone Well baby I won't be there To catch you when you fall I bet you're in a bar Cause I'm always your last call That is one of my favorite all time songs. Thank you. I mean, Talk about storytelling. Like it just, I totally feel where this person's coming from. Thank you. Who they are. Like, I don't know anything about them, but I feel like I know them. Yeah. So tell me. In a song. Tell me about how did that song come about? How did you, and who did you write that one? I wrote with? with Shane McAnally. Yeah. So how did you guys come up with the idea and just. We came in and he was talking about an ex that he had taken their name out of his phone, but the number would still pop up. Oh, yeah. And um, we just kind of started playing and, and we wrote, wrote that one pretty much from the top down. We didn't have a hook. Wow. Um, and we watched the Comedy Central roast of Pamela Anderson and we wrote that on Halloween. So how did Pamela Anderson fit into the song? <laughs> well, sometimes I feel like, sometimes I, I like to spend time crafting and doing that, but I feel like sometimes I need to get like my subconscious brain a little bit going. Yeah. So you start thinking about things and lines and stuff and then maybe step away from it in a minute and watch something or do something else. But it's still kind of back in there, mm -hmm. just rolling around. And, um, you know, I think it's one of those songs that I knew when we finished it that it was something special. Yeah, so you knew it the second you finished it. It's like, yeah. I mean, it's just one of those songs that's so real and it makes you feel. And so that, mm -hmm. that song just nailed it. And so how how long was the write? Did 
did it take a couple of days or did you finish it? It all was one day. One day. Um, and I don't remember exactly how long it was, but and it's definitely not always like this, but I felt like that right was very much felt like a zipper, you know, like it was just one piece led to another and it just came together. Um, it kind of unfolded. Right. And the pieces fell into place. And I don't always do that, but I have a lot done that to write a song from the first line down without a hook. And sometimes that really writes myself into a corner. I've written a lot yeah. of songs that end up, then you kind of don't get it right. But when it does work like that, it's really fun because as a writer too, the whole time you're like, what's happening next? Because right. <laughs> you don't really have it planned out. Yeah. And the, I find that when I have done that, when I did not start with the title, and guys, if you've never been on a Nashville co-write, many times we start out with a title we like, and then we write to that title. But there's other times where you'll have a piece of music or you'll have an opening line. You're like, well, I don't know where this is going. So then it's almost like you're just trusting that feeling that you're going to get somewhere. Yeah. And it's interesting. I mean, I don't know. I wrote with I wrote with Mike Reed a couple of times and he called it the river, but I feel like sometimes you kind of just when everything's right and you're in the muse is lined up, it seems like you just get into this place where you're just kind of plugged in to that creativity. And every so often it hits like that and it's the best feeling. Like you're channeling the song from mm -hmm. somewhere. Sometimes like have you ever finished a song and been like, this has already gotta be a song. I like it feels right. like I know this already, and it's not, but it is, and it does feel like sometimes you just happen to be the one to, to pull it out. Yeah, I mean, we talked about Elton John, so why not talk about Paul McCartney? He's, <laughs> he says that when he wrote Yesterday, he would go around playing it for people and going, did I steal this from somewhere? It sounds like I've heard it before. It was that same kind of thing. <laughs> And no one's ever been able to say, oh, yesterday's melody came from somewhere else, you know, but it just felt like one of those melodies that was always there. inevitable. Yeah, like inevitable. I there. like that word. Yeah. Yeah. And so that that doesn't happen all the time. But, you know, mm -hmm. when it does, you usually feel like you have something special. And it, I think that's one of the things, you know, you talked about when you were getting getting started and writing and stuff. Like Ralph Murphy, he had a blog called Murphy's Law, which he's got a book out now. Mm -hmm. uh, he's passed, but that I was obsessed with that in high school. I used to go and I would print it out on the dot matrix printer at my, I went to boarding school and I'd print it out and read over it. And um, I got a lot of ideas from there and it helped to kind of, I don't know, there were like different challenges and ways to break down writing and look at it and think about things. Um that were really interesting to me. And I don't know where I was going with that, but that's, that's great. It's perfect. <laughs> um, uh, were you thinking perhaps that you had done some studying of the craft? Oh, yes. The... So, you know, the, to find those songs that just come like that, and, you know, some everybody's different. But I feel like another thing that I, I had heard beforehand was, Harlan Howard said you should write 100 songs and throw them away. Well, I don't know if you should throw them away, but right. I did definitely like make that a goal for myself early on. And just I think one thing that helps with is that you just become more confident and more comfortable with the process and finishing a song. Because and some writers are really big on going back and rewriting things. I mean, there are songs that have been cut and then they're rewritten before they're cut again, you know, Um <laughs> Thinking about, really? on the other hand, uh, Keith Whitley and Randy Travis, there are different, there are different verses on that. Oh, wow. Uh, a little bit. <laughs> I mean, I went to see Rodney Crowell the other night, and he played a song that he had been cut by Emil Harris, I don't know, 30 years ago, and he rewrote it. <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> You're not sure if it's better? <laughs> I don't know, but Rodney's a genius, yeah. so obviously I would be <laughs> very... How do you improve perfection? Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, and I think it's interesting, too, because maybe, like, Rodney's one of the most interesting people I've seen talk about writing. Um, but, you know, he went through a phase where he just, all of a sudden, he does not, he only likes hard rhymes now. Mm -hmm. But to me, some of my favorite lines of his were when they were soft rhymes, a couple of the soft rhymes. Yeah. But, you know, you experience different things, you see different things, and he is definitely a master craftsman so it's just interesting to, it is interesting to hear people like him and 
Gretchen Peters uh, talk about their their process, the way they do things. But Chuck Cannon told me one time that he was writing with a great writer, Mac Davis, and he said they spent all day. They had to have hard rhymes all the way down the right side of the page, and they finish. And Chuck was just like exhausted. And then Mac goes. Now we're going to rhyme hard rhymes down the middle of the page. <laughs> and so they worked on it until they got yeah, that. I <laughs> love it. But yeah. I think there's merits in all kinds of different approaches. And, and a lot of times, you know, it's up to the song. It's what that song. Right. Yeah. Whatever the song needs. But it is so interesting. And I do think, like, the more you write, I have one thing I've noticed with talking to newer writers. And I guess I've been lucky that I've never been like this. And as a singer and artist, I'm not either. Like, I understand there's perfection and I want to be at a certain level of things, but I feel like there's certain merit to letting go at some point. Mm -hmm. If if you're a new writer and you're this is your third song and you're working on it and you just feel like it's not right yet, okay, well, but maybe it would behoove you to just set that song aside and go write another song and just go through the process again, because a lot of times I've found over the years, I would go through periods of time too, where I might have kind of a similar theme going in several different songs, but you pick up things, you figure out how to get parts of it right, or mm -hmm. you, you learn stuff through writing another song that maybe you bring back to that. And, and for some people, maybe that's not the case. I mean, maybe some people, they're only going to write 12 songs in their whole life and those are going to be perfectly crafted and do that. But, I don't know. I think sometimes you can just start being really hard on yourself if you get too focused on one, yeah, one thing. So maybe just doing something else for a little while can, yeah, can help. And coming back, I know early on some of the first cuts I got were songs that took me three or four different days of writing, and I I felt like after I got into the grind of of Nashville, there there was more and more pressure to like go in and a couple of hours write a song and you know and then and I've had some success doing songs that way too but I think what I've started to learn more recently is it just takes whatever it takes to get it right yeah so if you can't finish a song in one day and you have to come back three or four times who cares you know yeah I've had songs that I wrote really fast and I've had songs that's taken years to finish I have one song right now that I know is going to be great someday. <laughs> but, I mean, I've literally been working on it with my co-writer for at least two or three years. Wow. And it's a story song, so we're still waiting right. to find, like, what is that turn in the story? And sometimes I think maybe those can be a little harder, but I don't know. I think it's going to be worth it. Excellent. And I'll just pull it out every so often and bang my head against the wall for a couple hours, and then I'll put it back and just... Yeah. Someday I'm gonna go through some experience or see some movie or hear some conversation and it's gonna it's gonna link. Yeah, I was just talking with Brian Davis. He wrote um, a Lee Bryce song called Memory I Don't Mess With. Mm -hmm. It's a wonderful song. And he said he had that title and he kind of had a little melody for the hook in his head. And he carried it around for a couple of years, never wrote it. And then he threw it out to Lee and they were all excited. Lee's like, it's gonna be my single i know is just what i'm looking for so they wrote a chorus and then they didn't even come back to the song and for like a year down the road like they completely forgot about that. it and then they remembered it a year down the road when they were writing with billy montana he wrote a verse and then like but that song literally took years to come to fruition and at any point they could have just forgotten about it and, right you know but that song was meant to, to come to life. I mean, it's just wild the different journeys that songs take. And I try to think about it as having, you know, you have a lifetime of of writing. But And then even the songs you do write, sometimes it takes a long time for them to find where they're supposed to be or find another life. And it's always interesting to me how a song will be there forever and then when someone does actually cut it it's like it instantly changes <laughs> the song yeah it um, changes it's how you feel about it change how the world feels about mm -hmm. it changes still the same song but maybe it just was not the right moment right i had a song that just got cut 
by Willie Nelson. And it's 17 years old. <laughs> wow. It's been that same song the whole time. It's just been out there waiting. And <laughs> Can you say the name of it? Uh, it's Yeah, it's called I Wrote This Song For You. Ugh. Sometimes I feel like I'm just like addicted to gambling or something being in this business. Because it's those little this. moments that the magic happens and you're just like, everything else was worth it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So I got four questions for you to finish up. Rapid fire. <laughs> Best well-crafted song of all time. Um, I don't know, but Poncho and Lefty is my favorite. Oh, it's nice. Best guilty pleasure song of all time. Uh, I don't know. That's a really good question. Maybe Scrubs. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I don't know if that's really guilty or not, but... <laughs> Uh, favorite song you've written yourself? Uh, the next one. <laughs> <laughs> and best advice for an aspiring songwriter? I think just uh, to me, like the easiest and hardest thing is to be yourself in your songs. Because kind of the same way that we were saying, you will be, you know, you have that feeling like, has this already been written? You write something, you'll be like, well, this isn't like a very unique way to say it, but it is because it's your voice. That's how you're saying it. And right. um, no one else can do that. Right. Keep it real. Okay, y'all. See you next episode. Thanks, Aaron. Thank you for having me. Yes. Cheers. Cheers.